Everyone gets to memorize this and write it 15 times. Welcome to the coolest, hippest half hour of fun on TV. This is Brain Stew with Jennifer Pulley. Explore the past, present, and future of space travel as we visit the U.S. Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville, Alabama. This week, Brain Stew uncovers the early space missions and finds out how today's space shuttle works. Plus, we visit NASA and learn all about the International Space Station. The what? Watch Brain Stew and find out. Hey you, on the couch? Hey, welcome to Brain Stew. My name is Jennifer Pulley. You know, everyone keeps talking about the millennium. The new millennium. Do you even know what a millennium is? Of course, a millennium is a thousand years. Got it. You know what a century is? Sure, a century is a hundred years. Yeah, try this one. What about a decade? It's ten years. Okay, here's a stumper. Do you know what century we're in right now? Hmm, the 20th century. Yeah, you got it. We are at the end of the 20th century, which means we are about to begin a new thousand years or a new millennium. So, I thought it would be cool to study the past, the present, and future of space exploration at the U.S. <laughs> space and Rocket Center. Get this, people dreamed of going into space for over a thousand years before it became a reality. As early as the second century, that's uh, about 1900 years ago, people were writing about imaginary trips to the moon. Now, even though all these people dreamt and theorized about space travel, actual space travel didn't begin until the 20th century, the 1900s. Why? because it wasn't until the 20th century that rockets and spaceships could be produced. In the early 20th century, rockets and rocket engines were designed to help launch and propel spacecraft. By the mid-20th century, the United States and Russia became competitors in the space race as they raced to be the first to put a man into space. Who won the race? Russia did. Back then, Russia was called the USSR. On April 12, 1961, Russian cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the first man in space. He orbited the Earth once and landed safely. The Russians beat us. But the space race continued. About one month later, and this little guy right here, Alan Shepard became the first American astronaut to go into space. Basically, guys, he went up and he came back down. Now, in 1962, John Glenn Jr., heard of him, in this exact same capsule, became the first American to orbit the Earth. And guess what? He did it three times, not just once. Right in there, baby. Throughout the 1960s, many space programs were being developed. For example, the Apollo space program was designed by U.S. President John F. Kennedy. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things not because they are easy, but because they are hard. It was his goal to land a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth by the end of the decade. Did President Kennedy achieve his goal? He sure did. In July 1969, Edwin Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong made their historic landing on the moon. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Hey, didn't Neil Armstrong say something important when he stepped on the moon? That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Yep, and it sure was. Of course, there have been many missions into space. What was the first United States space mission? Well, we have here the monkeys. Monkeys were the very first thing that went up, and this is Abel and Baker. Oh, they're so cute. And they went up, like, back in 1959, and there's the capsule that they were in, and then we have the nose cone, which is right beside it. And they went up in the Jupiter. Wow, so they were inside of that, inside of this. Yes. Oh, gosh, and they came back and they were okay? They were okay, they were fine. What space program came after Abel and Baker? Well, it was the Mercury program. This was the trainer they used, but the Mercury capsule was exactly like this. This small? This small. You're kidding me. So you can see that the men were very short going in here. They were no taller than 5'11". 
what Mercury wanted to do was to investigate how man's ability to function up into space. They wanted to be able also to recover man and spacecraft safely. Yeah. They also wanted to see how the astronaut could work in here. What came after the Mercury program? It was the Gemini program. All right, you got some Gemini stuff right We've got a Gemini capsule right here that they trained in. All right, now two people? Two people. All right, Gemini, that means two, doesn't it? It means two. With the Gemini program, you've got the astronauts Gus Grissom and John Young. They went up in March 23rd, 1965, and their first flight used an onboard computer. And then with Gemini 4, with uh, James McDivitt and Ed White, during the time frame of June 3rd through June 7th, 1965, Ed White was the very first American to do the first spacewalk, and he was out roughly 23 minutes. Out in space, just hanging out. Just out in space with his tether. The accomplishments for Gemini was to see if the astronauts and the equipment could withstand space flight up to 14 days. They wanted to be able also to rendezvous and dock with other orbiting vehicles. They also wanted to perfect methods of re-entry into the atmosphere, and they also wanted to land at a pre-selected place. What came after Gemini? Well, this is the Apollo program. This is the command module trainer that was used to prepare the astronauts for flight to the moon and back. The astronauts received instruction on the flight control. They had life support and communications. Whoa, so you're telling me in this trainer, this is how they trained to go to the moon. The Apollo program was going to the moon now. Yes, this is how they got all the visuals and the illusions and how to get to the moon and how to operate the Apollo capsule. Hey, Kathy, this kind of looks like the trainer that I was just in. Yes, it is. This is the actual Apollo 16 capsule here that was equipped with the controls to allow the crew to guide during the flight. This is where they lived and worked and everything. Yes. Right in here. Lived worked, ate, slept, everything was done right in here. It was too small. How did Apollo land on the moon? Right here we have the lunar excursion module. This is what the astronauts landed on the moon with. This is a two-stage, self-sufficient spacecraft. They could live on it temporarily. What kind of car is this? Well, this is the lunar rover, or they call this the moon buggy. <laughs> now, the moon buggy was built so that the astronauts could explore more of the lunar surface. Now, the rover's wheels were made out of piano wire and titanium strips. Cool. And the, the speed of this was about eight miles an hour, but on the moon, that was pretty fast. Yeah, sure, because it's a microgravity environment. Exactly. Now, that thing looks pretty big. You're telling me that that huge moon buggy fit on this? I don't know it's, about that. We sure did, and let me show you how it folds out very neatly in here. Well, what they do is the seats fold over very easily, and then they fold the wheels over into the main frame, <laughs> and then the wheels go like this. Oh my gosh. It folds up very neatly. They say this is about the size of a playpen when it's all folded up. And it fit right in there. And fits right in there. What propelled the Mercury capsule when it went into space? Okay, well this is the Mercury Redstone rocket here. And this is what got Alan Shepard to do his 15 minute suborbital flight. And then right over here beside us is the Atlas. And this is what got John Glenn to go up and do his three orbits around the Earth. What propelled the Apollo to the moon? This is the Saturn V rocket here. This is the world's largest vehicle to use for space exploration. The Saturn V here was used to launch the astronauts and their equipment to the moon. Now these five large engines is the first stage of the moon rocket, which produced 7.8 million pounds of thrust. Just one of these large engines consumed 5,000 gallons of fuel. Now the, the fuel that they used right in here was, was liquid oxygen and kerosene. And you said 5,000 gallons just for one of these? Just for one of them. So if you do your math, 25,000 gallons 25, of this fuel. 25, yes. Goodness gracious. So this is the first stage right here, this huge bottom section. This is the muscle. When this gets it up into the atmosphere, right? Yes. Then this drops off. This falls off, and then the second stage kicks in, which, which is, right, is here. right here. Okay. This is what gets it up to the upper atmosphere. When this falls off, then we got the third, the very third stage, and this is what gets it to the moon. Okay, out of the Earth's atmosphere on the uh, way to the moon. Right, onto the moon, oh, wow. orbit its moon. Okay, now this is the third stage. Does this drop off? Yes, this drops off, Gosh. and this is what pushes <laughs> it up into the orbit of the moon. So all these pieces that drop off, they're just gone? They're gone. That's it, they're, they're not reusable. Not reusable. 
I guess that's why we created the space shuttle. That's right. So we could reuse things. I got it. Okay, inside this piece, of course we can't see in it, but okay. if we were to look in, what would be in there? There's just where the lunar module would be, right in here, inside the lamb. The, the lamb. All right, so that's what actually landed on the moon. Right. And so. is that still there today? Yes, they are. There are six of those sitting on the moon right now. That's so neat. All right, where are the astronauts? We still haven't gotten to the astronauts yeah, yet. The astronauts are right up here, the very end of all this. Oh, they can see out through the holes, right? Right. Uh huh. Now, but this part does not ever break off. This all stays intact. Is that yes, correct? Yes. So, well, actually, what happens is when it's ready to go, it turns around and docks with the lunar module, and they hook up together. So it takes all this rocket to get them to the moon. From space modules to space shuttles, space travel sure has come a long way. What's happening in the new millennium? Up next, Brain Stew checks out all the parts of a full-size space shuttle. Plus, we'll visit NASA and see what they're building for the future in space. Okay, so now your brain knows a little bit more about what's been happening in space over the past century and past millennium. For the past two decades, the Space Transportation System, better known to you and me as the Space Shuttle, has become the major U.S. space program. What are the different parts of a Space Shuttle? All right, the shuttle actually consists of four different parts. The very top part is the orbiter, or the actual spacecraft. The white solid rocket boosters, one on either side. The main external tank is the big brown tank that you see in the center. Uh -huh. And at the very rear of the orbiter are the three main engines. This is called a launch configuration. And of course it would be standing on end. Yep, yep. The uh, shuttle takes off like a rocket, but it lands like an aircraft or a plane. Much different from the Apollo and the Gemini missions. Exactly, the that's exactly right. The external tank actually holds all of the fuel that are necessary for the three main engines. But that alone is not enough to get the orbiter actually into orbit. Uh -huh. So the main, uh, the two solid rocket boosters are needed to give that extra boost to actually get it out into space. The neatest part about our shuttle is that everything on it is reusable, except for the big brown tank that's in the middle. Once our orbiter uh, is, is off the ground, the engines keep running for about eight minutes and the boosters do break away and fall back into the ocean. We're able to retrieve those and reuse them. Oh, great. And of course, the orbiter is reused over and over and over again. Exactly. That's exactly right. So, as I said, it will glide back to the Earth, getting into the atmosphere, and it is able to land like a, a, a plane. It glides, but with no engines. Why doesn't the orbiter burn up upon entering Earth's atmosphere? Well, it has to have a thermal protection system, and there are actually four different types located on the orbiter. The first one is called the reinforced carbon-carbon, and it's the gray carbon composite that's located around the nose, edges of the wings, and then there's a small amount underneath it where the external tank attachment is. Yeah. This can withstand the greatest temperature range of anywhere from minus 250 degrees up to 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the most the orbiter would ever experience, and that is hotter than the inside of a volcano. Goodness. The second type of protection is called the advanced flexible reusable surface insulation. It's actually found on the payload bay doors, both inside and out the sides of the orbiter, tops of the wings, vertical stabilizer, and around these observation windows. It's actually this quilted, waterproof blanket. It's made with silica felt, sewn between layers of glass cloth with silica thread. There are 2,300 of these quilted blankets located on each orbiter, glued with an adhesive, actually, to the orbiter. Gosh. 
The third type is called the felt reusable surface insulation. And it's just along the very edge or the top of the payload bay doors, and this can withstand about 700 degrees. The fourth type is called the high temperature reusable surface insulation, and that is underneath the orbiter. It's also found around these forward windows, the leading and trailing edges of the vertical stabilizer, and it's on the back of the orbiter, which is called the body flap. And there are about 24 up to 34,000 of these black tiles on each orbiter. Each orbiter is custom made and each tile is made to be positioned on a specific spot on each one. So that's why there's a different number of them on each orbiter. And if one of the tiles um, it gets damaged upon reentry, it, it can be replaced. All right, these black tiles can withstand about 2,300 degrees. They can immediately be immersed in cold water. They're about 90% air and 10% of the silica material. I can put my hand directly behind the tile. I don't feel any of the heat at all from the blowtorch. Whoa, it's These, orange. Yes, it is. These tiles last for about 100 shuttle missions, and after each mission, only 15 or 20 of them usually need to be replaced. When the orbiter re-enters the Earth's atmosphere, the entire underside does glow this orange that you see. Whoa. So that's where we are today. Space travel really has gone from being just a dream thousands of years ago to reality. What's next and how will it affect me? Well, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, that's NASA for short, they've been building something. It's called the International Space Station. That's it right there, that's what it's gonna look like. And guess who the United States has been working with in order to get this permanent space station off the ground and into space? Russia, they're all buddies. What is the International Space Station? The International Space Station is going to be the biggest spaceship ever put together. It's going to be a science laboratory floating in space and a jumping off point for trips to the other planets. When did NASA begin building the International Space Station? It started being uh, put together uh, around 1990, and the, some of the biggest pieces were shipped just in 1997 and 1998. The first pieces were launched in November of 1998 on a Russian rocket, and then in December of 98 on the space shuttle. And now we're putting it together piece by piece. So you mean some of it's already up there right now? Right, two big pieces are up there, and we're going to be sending up even bigger chunks of it in 1999. Chunks like the one we're in right now? That's right. This is called the U.S. Uh, HAB module. This is where, one of the places where the astronauts will live on the space station. How will the International Space Station help people like me in the future? Well, the International Space Station is where we're going to learn what it takes to keep an astronaut healthy when they're up floating around up in space for months and months and years and years. And eventually it's going to be the place where we all get together to build our spaceships that take people to Mars and the other planets. You're going to build spaceships on the International Space Station? Well, someday. Someday we think it'll be kind of like a dock, like where they build ships, and we'll just build them up above the air, floating around. One of the first things we're going to study on the ISS is what we call gravity, or when you don't have gravity, which we call microgravity, or floating. Everybody sees the astronauts float around up on the space shuttle. It turns out that gravity on Earth affects lots of things we do that we never even think about, how we make things, how fires burn, either to damage property or to generate all our energy, how we move all our chemicals around, and how our bodies work. And that's the first thing we're going to be looking at hard on the International Space Station. Up next, we find out what it's like to live and work in space. How do astronauts do it? Plus, I'm going on a mission to Mars, or, or maybe a journey to Jupiter. Who knows? Oh, yeah, uh, we got this week's experiment. Don't go away. Hey guys, welcome back. Wasn't the International Space Station awesome? Check out this model. It's a working model. You know, the International Space Station isn't too far off in the future. Speaking of the future. How will the astronauts live and work on the International Space Station? Well, working in space is a challenge because of microgravity. So everything we do, you have to keep that in mind. It's designed for floating, and that's what we are now doing here yeah. on the station. If you'd like, we can begin down here sure. in our uh, 
crew quarters unit, which is like the astronaut's bedroom. This is where they sleep? This is where they sleep. So if you'd like to step inside that sleeping bag there, I'll zip you up. Your arms go Where's through the bed? Skulls. This is the bed. We are floating. You're in a neutral buoyancy position, so your arms are out. It's actually very comfortable is sleeping really? in there. The sleeping bag is just so that you don't bump into your experiments or possibly wake <laughs> up in the bathroom or something like that. Floating. Do you like to sleep with your head on a pillow, Jennifer? Yeah, I love to. Well, in order to do that, you do have to use this Velcro strap and strap your head to it. Wow. First thing in the morning when you wake up, Jennifer, you're probably going to need to use the bathroom. Oh, yeah, that's very important. This is our waste management compartment. The astronauts jokingly call the toilet a target, however. <laughs> it is a little bit hard to aim for it. I'm sure. Stay on it, and you definitely don't want to float off of it. No. Make quite a mess. <laughs> so we have to have some restraint. So if you'll have a seat up there, Jennifer. All right. I'll explain this. This is a little personal. Yes, it is. <laughs> have a seat. Your feet do go through those foot restraints. These are thigh restraints that come up and over the astronaut's thigh. That's right. And those two restraints keep the astronaut on target. <laughs> Between your legs there, Jennifer, is a black hose. If you'll just pull up on that and show that. That is not for breathing, Jennifer. Okay, good. That is for urine collection. Oh. <laughs> it uses a vacuum system. We can't use water, of course. So sure. we do have to force that liquid down the tube into a tank where it's stored. Solid waste from the target uses the same vacuum, but it's stored separately from our liquid waste. All right. I think I'm done. <laughs> All right. Float out of there. <laughs> Okay, I've done my business, right. so uh, now right. what's next? <laughs> All right, showering is quite a challenge. Uh, float on in there for okay. me, Jennifer. Probably not as large as your shower is at no. home. No. Definitely no. not. The two hand units, if you'll hold those for me, um, are necessary. That one is for your water. Uh, this one is a vacuum, because after you've showered, you will have to vacuum the water off of your hair and your skin. If you didn't do that, it's going to clean because of something called surface tension without the gravity to pull it off of your body. So it takes about a half hour of rubbing to get it all off. The water, however, globs together when it comes out. It doesn't spray on you. So it looks like jello floating around. And you do have to catch these globs and press them to your skin. So going from one spot to the other and bathing is quite time consuming. After all that, I'm starving. That's exactly right. Oh. You're ready for breakfast. Yeah. This is our kitchen, of course, on a ship. A kitchen is a galley. The drawers that you see are refrigerators and freezers, not like ours at home. Hmm. Everything is stored in these drawers. Food packets are usually labeled because most foods are pre-selected by our astronauts. Mm -hmm. So the letter represents the astronaut's name, the numbers, the meal of the day. There might be three or four packets for each meal. They reheat these in their combination confection microwave oven. Uh -huh. Some foods might be freeze dried. This is a meat patty. You just inject your water in here and heat it up, open up and eat. Our water is from an ECLIS system and that's an environmental control life support system that controls the air, water processes, temperature and humidity on the station. Just have a swig of my delicious space mm -hmm. water, Jennifer. Tell me what you think. Mmm, hit the spot. Very good. Very good water. Now I'll just tell you where that water you drank came from. It was actually the shower water, hand wash water, mm -hmm. even the sweat from our astronauts, the moisture from their breath, and 85% of the water from the urine. Yummy, huh? You just drank that? You just drank that. <gasps> actually though, Jennifer, we drink <laughs> recycled water every day here on Earth from our waste management plants, but we don't think about that. This is cleaner and more pure than the earth water we drink every day. It tasted day. fine, really. It really is a better cup of water. To begin our work day, we'd have to float through a hatchway and into a laboratory module to begin our work day. Uh, this particular one is called our furnace, and it was designed right here at the Marshall Space Flight Center, but it's for making new materials in space. Huh. You might say, why would we want to do that? And I usually just use this colored water and sand container to explain that to the children. When you shake it up, what happens to the sand and water in there, Jennifer? They become mixed. That's exactly right. What if I stop shaking it? What happens They'll now? They'll separate. That's right. What causes it to do that? Well, gravity does. Gravity. But you see, in microgravity, those materials stay mixed up together. And so we're going to experiment with a lot of different materials that normally would separate here on Earth. Put them in a test tube similar to this one. Insert them into our furnace. Activate our furnace and those materials will melt together and become one. Wow, they're so well mixed. 
So we're hoping to have a stronger material with fewer defects and it will last longer. We may be using these materials someday in our homes, cars, and medical instruments. Gosh, and it's all being tested up in space? That's exactly right. What will astronauts do in the new millennium? Well, besides living on board the International Space Station, they may be helping to design a colony to live on the moon, as well as being aboard a manned mission to Mars. What forces move rockets into space? Let's do this experiment and find out. All you need is a nine inch balloon. And now, the procedure. Step one. Blow up the balloon all the way and hold it shut with your fingers. Step two, release the balloon and watch what happens. Did you see that? The balloon moved around the room as it deflated. Why did this happen? I'll tell you. When the inflated balloon is closed, the air inside pushes equally on all directions. As the air leaves the balloon, the opening moves back and forth, causing the balloon to fly around the room. The balloon, like a rocket, moves because of Newton's third law of motion, which states for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. In the case of the balloon, the action force is the air coming out of the opening. The reaction force is the air pushing on the balloon in the opposite direction of the action force. Like the balloon, spacecraft are able to move forward because of the action reaction forces. The engines of a rocket force gases out of the exhaust. The gas left inside the rocket causes it to lift up. Hey, do you want more? Stay tuned for the new millennium. I'll see you and that big brain of yours next week on Brain Stew. Well, that is if I'm back from my journey to Jupiter. Hey, you know what Neil Armstrong said when he first stepped foot down your foot down? You see that? The mo the, the <laughs> Up. <laughs> I thought she was, I thought she was, what century are we in? No, what century?